On November 22, 1963, Erlene Roberts, the housekeeper of the boarding house owned by Gladys Johnson, was watching As the World Turns on a television identical to this one, right here in this very room, when her show was interrupted by breaking news. Because of copyright, I had to recreate this myself. Right now you would be hearing the theme music to As the World Turns. And now, for the next 30 minutes, As the World Turns. Hmm. That's real nice of the boy. Hmm. And I thought about it. And I gave it a great deal of thought, Grandpa. Here is a bulletin from CBS News. In Dallas, Texas... Three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. The first reports say that President Kennedy has been seriously wounded by this shooting. Erlene reacted to this probably similarly to people all over the world. Shock, sadness, devastation, terror, disbelief. But what she didn't know at the time was that one of their boarders would be accused of being the shooter of the president. Hello to all of my history-loving friends. This is Madame Morbid. I am your guide on any number of historical adventures. I visited the boarding house when I was in Dallas. I had a long conversation with Gladys Johnson's granddaughter, Patricia Hall. She now owns the house and runs it as the Lee Harvey Oswald Rooming House Museum. The house is located at 1026 North Beckley Avenue, it is about two miles from the textbook depository. It is very close, within a mile of the Neely Street house. Lee Harvey Oswald had been renting a room at that boarding house since October 14th. After returning to Dallas with his family from New Orleans, he rented the room under the name O.H. Lee. What's interesting is, to this day, Patricia calls him Mr. Lee. He rented the room for $8 a week. Patricia told me a lot of great information about her grandmother and her mother. Gladys Johnson was a very fascinating woman. She was born in 1902. She had a fourth grade education. Her husband, Albert, supported the family in the 20s and 30s by running a series of restaurants. And he fell extremely ill with extreme rheumatoid arthritis. That appears to run in the family because Patricia's mother, Stella, also came down with this horrible affliction. But he worked in the restaurant as long as he could. He had a special grill designed for him that allowed him to continue to work with everything within reach of him despite the fact that his spine was so stooped and ravaged by the arthritis, he was practically bent over. He began teaching Gladys everything she needed to know to take over their business. And when he died, she learned that she had a very good mind for business. She did not want to live in the same house where her husband died with all those memories. That's when she bought this house in 1943. And Patricia said, everyone always wondered why she bought such a massive house. The way this house looks is very deceiving. It is massive. The main floor of the house has seven bedrooms. Gladys rented out five of those. There are five bedrooms in the basement and a bath, and Gladys rented out all of those rooms as well. Then in 52, she decided the backyard was a complete waste of space. She built a two-story addition with four bedrooms and a bath on the top floor and four bedrooms and a bath on the bottom floor for a total of 18 rooms. In addition to this boarding house, she also had rooming houses that she rented out in other areas of the city. She also continued to operate one diner downtown. She had a phenomenal mind for business, and she did it without any formal education. Patricia's mother, her name was Stella Fay. She was an artist. She was a photographer, and she discovered that if she applied for jobs using her female name, she would not get an interview. She dropped Stella and began using her middle name, F-A-Y-E, which is the feminine spelling, she began going by F-A-Y, which is the male spelling in French. If she did that, she would get the interview. And if they actually saw her portfolio, 
she would get hired. Gotta love that misogyny. The women in Patricia's family are pretty amazing. On October 14th, Lee Oswald came and arranged to rent a room. Some things I'm going to tell you about the building now. The carpet was not there when he was. There is hardwood floor underneath the carpet. Patricia said she'd like to remove the carpet to get it back to the way it was in 1963, but there are so many other things that the house needs, it's not really high on the priority list right now. The end tables were there. The couch is the same, although it has been reupholstered. From the looks of it, in the 90s, the stand-up lamp, this was there. Most all of the knickknacks, she said, were there when he was. The leather chair, which she has had to rope off, was there that day. The wicker chairs were not the ones that she is sitting in. They're old because her mother owned them, but they were not in the living room at the time. The wardrobe in his room area is the same, and the jacket is an exact replica of the one he ran back into the room to retrieve right after the assassination happened. The television is the exact make and model that was in the living room at the time. She said a member of an AV club took the model that was there and looked for one until he found one and actually set it up so that it could play DVDs. Now, with that a little background information, I'm going to turn it over to Patricia and share with you portions of our conversation. I'm not going to share it all just because of how long it was. I'm going to stick to just things having to do with Oswald, but she told me uh, some amazing stories about the women in her life, her mother, her grandmother, and I will put all of that on Patreon so you can see it completely unedited. So without further ado, let's get started. The first question I asked Patricia was how often she was at her grandmother's boarding house. I missed the very beginning of her answer. She starts to say she went every day with her two brothers. Their ages were she was 11 and then her brothers were 10 and 6. We came here every day after school. It was your typical get the homework done, wait for mom to pick you up to take you home. And... Uh, he is the only rumor that ever played with my brothers. My brothers adored him. He'd come home from work, go to his room for a while, come back out. If the boys were in here watching TV with me, he'd just look at and say, let's go play. And they'd run out. The only sound I ever heard from them was absolute delightful laughter when he was playing with them. And he would play until my mother got here to pick us up. Sometimes as little as 30 minutes. But if she was photographing a wedding, because she was a photographer, or she needed to finish a painting, because she was an artist for a customer, it, would, it might be three hours. And he would play with them for three hours. That's not your typical 24-year-old. I asked Patricia what her grandmother Gladys thought about President Kennedy. Was she a fan? Was she excited he was coming to town? My grandmother really wasn't a political person. Not that I can ever, you know, in those days when I was growing up, children were to be seen, not heard. And because I was the only girl with 18 men living here. She didn't allow me to go outside to play. Mm -hmm. So I learned the art of listening. Mm -hmm. And that's how I learned so much about Mr. Lee, was listen, listening to my mother, after, my grandmother after the fact. Talking with Patricia really reinforced something I'd already been learning through my research, which is that Oswald was great with kids he played with Ruth's kids. He obviously played a lot with Gladys's grandchildren. And he did something wonderful for Patricia in that she was struggling with dyslexia just like he had. And he really took her under his wing and helped her with her homework pretty much completely in secret to help her understand the condition that she had. Neither one of them knew that they had something called dyslexia, but he had taught himself to deal with it 
and he helped her with it as well. He was very sweet to us. I think he related to me because I think he could tell that I was struggling with dyslexia like him. But no one knew I was struggling. They just, you know, back in the day, children were categorized pretty much only in four categories. You were either smart, you were a lazy learner, you were a slow person, or you were just plain stupid. And he does end up with a juvenile record because he starts skipping school. I mean, why go? You can't pass a test because you can't read. But he spent his school hours at the local public library teaching himself how to read. Some of the librarians remembered him as a child. Um, and they said that he would, you know, come up to their desk if he couldn't figure out a word and ask them, what's this word? And then he'd ask them to spell it. And so they'd spell it. Naturally, they were thinking, uh, it's right in front of you. But he'd had, they'd spell it to him. If he couldn't figure out the meaning of the word from the content of the sentence or paragraph, he would ask them, what's that mean? And they'd tell him. He was memorizing. Because that's the way I learned to read. I, would, I knew what the word looked like all jumbled up. But I knew people were telling me it was supposed to be this way. And so I had to memorize what this is supposed to look like. So that my, I trained my brain to mix it. I asked Patricia how Oswald's having dyslexia affected his ability to read and write Russian. Because it has such a different alphabet. Well, once he, once he mastered the dyslexia in English... I think his brain just took over and was that because once so many of the Russian letters are backwards mm -hmm. to what we do. And I think once he learned what letters were backwards, his brain just went. Hmm. It's fascinating. Yeah. He was actually a brilliant young man. Yeah. Uh, he does get, uh, when he joins the Marines at 17, as far as I know, the Marines and the Air Force were the only branches that required a high school diploma. He didn't have one. He quit when he was 15 years old. But obviously the recruiter saw this disconnect because he spoke eloquently. He didn't make friends because he, by the time he's 15 and he quit school, he had been in 18 different schools. That means sometimes he was going to two different schools in a year. How can you make friends, long-term friends, in that type of an environment? So the library becomes a school, and becomes his friend and his teacher. So he uh, uh, masters. So he did. They did give him an IQ test uh, before they let him totally join the Marines, and it came back almost at genius level. Oswald scored a 118 on his IQ test. That score comes in around average intelligence. Genius level is around a 130, but I don't know how highly people view IQ tests anymore. Their origins are pretty dubious. They were designed as a way to keep out certain ethnicities from coming to the United States as immigrants. So they would give them this test to prove the superiority of certain groups over others. 
So I don't really know how accurate they are or how highly they are taken into account in this day and age. This is what I found when checking it independently. I wanted to know more about him helping her with her homework, so I asked her to tell me a little more about that. Was it an everyday occurrence? Oh, no. No, we had to do that on the slide. My grandmother didn't like anyone helping me with my homework because as far as she was concerned, I was just lazy. I was smart, but I was just lazy. And so he, he would try to help me with my homework. Um, but he was always encouraging me. He, one of his comments to me on a fairly regular basis, if he saw the frustration building up, he'd just look at me and say, don't worry about it. Just do your best and it'll all work out. And another question he had to ask every once in a while, was what was the most interesting thing you learned in school today? I wanted to be able to answer him. So it did get me to pay a little closer attention at school so that I would have an answer if he asked the question. You know, when you're 11, you just really don't have long, in-depth, conversations with rumors. You just don't, you know. But it always made me feel good that he always acknowledged me and let me know there was a lot more to myself than what my grandmother saw. It made a big difference in my life. This was my favorite part of our conversation, and it just helped me realize what an impact even an individual can have on another person's life just by being kind, just by listening, especially with children. These interactions that we might have with a child can literally affect them for the rest of their lives. Now, my brothers, they had a much closer relationship with him because they would be outside and they would be playing. And they didn't have to hide that, I'm guessing. Well, they didn't have that kind of a devoted father. I mean, my dad was a nice guy and all that kind of stuff. But he had his own interests. And, and by the time, in 63, my, grand, my parents were already divorced. So we were being raised by my mother. And, you know... Uh, Daddy was a sweet man, but I will admit, he was an alcoholic. But he wasn't your mean drunk. You know, you hear the horror stories. It got in the way of a, a tighter family bond. It really did. We then discussed a little bit about Oswald also not having a father figure. So maybe he saw in her brothers these not fatherless children, but... Lacking that really close, strong, fatherly figure, maybe that influenced him wanting to play with these boys and him knowing what it was like to grow up without that fatherly figure. He also kind of wanted a boy. He was hoping that Marina's later pregnancy was going to be a boy. It didn't turn out that way, and there's no evidence he was upset about that, but I do think he also was drawn to little boys and wanting to play with little boys because he kind of wanted one. Out of all the years that my grandmother rented rooms, she never gave anyone kitchen privileges except Mr. Lee. She really liked him. She knew he was separated from his wife and that they were trying to get the family together. I, I never actually saw him go into the kitchen and cook, but he kept milk, bread, and sandwich makings in the refrigerator. That young man ate more sandwiches than you can shake a stick at, because <laughs> he ate them for breakfast, he took them for lunch, and he ate them for supper. What was his favorite kind? Honestly, I don't know, because he would keep a variety of 
lodge mates. In the Later after a tour of the house, and I will put the house tour at the end, we asked her about finding out about the assassination. How did she find out? And she would go on to share with us witnessing their friend assassinated on television. Well, we were at school. The principal comes on the air and tells us that we've lost the president. My mother, in 63, happened to have her photography studio across the street from the Texas Theater. She actually saw Mr. Lee being arrested. She didn't know why he was being arrested, but she recognized him as being a rumor here and the gentleman that played with her children. She was already upset about Kennedy. The day's obviously not getting any better. So she shut down. She shows up at the school just moments after the principal has made his big announcement. Takes us to our family home. Goes around and unplugs all the TVs. And, turn, and tells us that they're broke. Well, let's get down to the real important stuff. 11, 10, and 6-year-old. We know cartoons are supposed to start soon after school. And we look at her and go, Mom, we saw you unplug the TVs. And she got on a forklift. That's what we used to call it, which meant the back straightened, the shoulders came back. I see the broke. <laughs> we, we look at each other and go, Mama's gone nuts. Let's go play. So we go, she does not allow us to watch any TV whatsoever until Sunday. By Sunday, you could actually watch TV. We're having a late breakfast, watching something on TV. They break in with the transfer of Lee from city to county jail. Detective Lavelle brings Lee out. Jack Ruby steps forward and shoots him. My brothers go nuts. So that's how you found out. That's how we found out. My brothers are hysterical. That's Mr. Lee, that's Mr. Lee. Why did they shoot Mr. Lee? Mother jumps up, turns off the TV. It's broke again. And uh, has to sit down with the three of us and explain what he's accused of what's been going on over here with the FBI and police, and why we just saw our friends shot on TV. The question I really wanted to ask you yeah. is, what was that like for your grandmother, if she ever talked about it, to have the FBI knock on the door? Oh, she put up with them for two months during the major investigation. But after that, she didn't get interviews. She didn't do either. In fact, one about Two years after the assassination, a reporter came up to and was really kind of pushy about wanting to come in and interview her. And she was holding the door kind of, you know, up against him, but his foot was in the doorway. She finally turned and went, AC, go get the shotgun. And he went, lady, never mind. I understand. My grandfather was not sitting in this chair, and we didn't have a shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> All you need is the threat. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. But I just mean the shock of it. Uh -huh. Surely she didn't see it coming. Oh, well, the, the first 24, she was devastated with all of the different emotions. Shame, horror, the whole bit. Disbelief. But once she had a chance to sit down and think about the man she had living here, playing with her children, her grandchildren. That's when she came out to the family and said, he didn't do this. And that's what the family has maintained all these years. She then says she wants to tell one more story about Mr. Lee. It is her favorite and it involves her brothers. We're in the front yard wrestling. Not the best idea between the six and the 10. Mike gets hurt. He doesn't cry. He has a short fuse. He jumps up, tackles Hal. Now they're actually fighting. 
being the oldest, it's my turn, it's my job to stop the fight. By the time I get to the front screen door, Mr. Lee has already gone out there, separated them, and he sits them on the front stairs. And he sits in between them. And he looks at them and he says, boys, I'm gonna tell you something. And I want you to listen to me because it's very important. You're brothers. You gotta care for each other. You gotta love each other. And never do anything that would harm another human being. That's not life advice that a 24 year old tells two little boys that he's barely known six weeks. I think it says more about the core of the man than anything else. She starts to talk about Kennedy and what his loss costs the nation. She mentions donating the presidential salary and says there have only been two, Kennedy and Trump. There are actually more. George Washington initially refused a salary. Herbert Hoover, also one of the richest men to ever be president, he also donated his salary to charity. That may have somewhat been because of the Great Depression. But Kennedy actually donated his salary his entire political career. He donated his salary when he was in the House and the Senate, going on about 14 years. The only thing he kept when he was president was the expense account, which he used to pay for public events. These are the charities that JFK donated all of this money to, and over his entire political career, it came up to about $500,000. He gave to Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts of America, the United Negro College Fund, and the Cuban Families Committee. Kennedy's presidential salary came to $100,000. If we hadn't lost him when we did, I think our world would be totally different. Because he was a sweet, gentle man. And I think he was the most modern day president of the people. That, that we've ever had. You know, there's only two presidents that have, that never took a salary during their presidency. John Kennedy and Trump. He said, I'm not doing this for that. I'm doing this for the people. I think that's very important for people to real, realize. And he had lofty goals. I don't know if it's, good or bad or what, but the family fingerprints on this case is just everywhere. It just mm -hmm. is. It's just part of my life. Here's footage of us touring the house, along with additional stories that Patricia told us. The sound is pretty wonky. I guess because I'm usually talking directly into the microphone with it very close to me. And I guess with it just being a little farther away, it just wasn't as good. So I apologize for that. In the center here, these are paintings that my mother did. Oh my God. This is my grandmother as a little girl. And that's her brother sitting on the chair. Back in the day, they would put little, keep little boys in dresses because it was easier to change diapers and well, potty train. Sure. Yeah. And these are my biological grandfather's grandparents. And the, she painted these from a tin type that she had of them. And this is your mom? And that's my mom. What year is that photo from, you know? That's probably in the 80s. I was thinking maybe the 80s. Yeah, that's I think it's, you know. I love this TV. I know. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> but they actually fixed it so that I could show a DVD. Oh, wow. <laughs> How long ago was that that they found this for you? Four years ago. Okay. I have so many sweet people that. Oh my gosh. Were you watching this? No, you did not see that. Uh, we were still at school. Oh yes, because it was at twelve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there's the record player. It's still 
door. Yes. Oh, isn't that it's cool? Fun. <laughs> and the radio works. That when they when they restored it, they restored it. I really like this photo. Yeah, that's her in her final years with the meanest dog under the sun. <laughs> My mother got the little dog because she had read seniors needed something to get up for, to share their love with. And by this time, I'm having a family. It bit me and my brothers. It bit my children. Oh, my goodness. When I say no one was unhappy that that dog was dead except my grandmother, I mean it. The rest of us were going, yes! <laughs> yeah, your father was a very handsome man. Yeah, and too, unfortunately, too many women did that. Too. Oh, oh, really? Oh. <laughs> the drinking probably didn't help there. That's right. But this is my dad with the three of us, and then that's my brothers and I. Now, was this wallpaper up in 63? Oh, was yes. This, it was, okay. My, grand, my mother bought, picked it out when she was 19. Oh, okay. Yeah. This is the original bed that he slept on. It's not the 50-year-old mattress. That's just too creepy for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is the wardrobe closet that he actually used. And this is... Oh, the jacket. The jacket. The duplicate jacket that he would have worn that day. Wow. So amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty cool. See, I have some wonderful followers. So he came back for the jacket. Was it hanging in here? Uh-huh. Okay. And to retrieve his Smith & Wesson 38 revolver. Yeah, your grandma doesn't look like someone I'd want to mess with. No, no. <laughs> Absolutely not. These pictures, this is the only grandfather I knew. This is AC, and that's my grandmother. I'm 11, Hal's 10, Micah 6. Oh, so that's that. There. That's what we looked like in 63. Uh huh. the jacket hanging in there. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Oh, you have a picture of the picture on there? Uh -huh, that's in the National Archives. Oh. Oh, so the I National Archives jacket or they just... his jacket. Oh, wow. I think they have the rifle, too. Yes. Yeah. the rifle over there is not the original. No, it's not. And they were pretty open about that. She then allowed us into the kitchen, which is an area most people don't get to go. We asked to see some paintings that her mother had done when she was between the ages of 12 and 14. And she had described them to us, and I asked to see them, and she let us come into the kitchen and see them. I thank her very much for allowing us to do that. Oh, okay, okay. I started to say that looks like chalk. Yeah. Oh, this one, wow. this one is chalk, as well as that one. Wow. And she was doing those things when she was 12 and 14. I love this, oh. this too. That is gorgeous. Thank you. My mother put that up after my grandmother died. Oh. And I'm trying to get it all restored. It's fabulous. <laughs> when did she get this, do you know? What year is this? Oh. 
that stuff came in when my grandmother bought the house. So the 1940s. 40, 40, oh my gosh, yeah. Mm -hmm. This upcoming scene, I just thought it was funny. Uh, and the two leather chairs, they were my mother's. The only reason why they're roped off is I have learned that people today do not know how to sit down. They flop. <laughs> yes. And they've <laughs> broken the legs on them. Oh. And so and until I can get them properly fixed, I don't want them to be totally destroyed. So I just roped them off. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you like the content I create, please check me out on Patreon at patreon backslash Madam Morbid or just search Madam Morbid. $5 a month will give you access to bonus material, episodes too hot for YouTube, uncensored versions of all of my videos, get some more morbid history in your life, and help fund trips to places farther away from my headquarters than I'm currently able to go. But any support you want to give this channel is just much appreciated. Just watching my videos, giving a thumbs up, and watching it all the way through helps me more than anything, and sharing it with your friends. I want to thank Patricia Hall so much for her hospitality, for allowing us into her home, for sharing her memories and memories, and I will see you all next time.